Hello and welcome to Occupied France. I am, well, as you know, I am Bogibir, and this will be the first episode of a longer series where we will talk about, among other things, about the history and evolution of combat aircraft, where I will go through uh, short historical details about the airplanes, such as how they operated, how they flew, and what major battles they took part in, and I will show you of course as well how you can operate them yourselves within the environment of DCS because that is exactly what I am using. So among other things we will actually dive down into history, into the 1940s, and I have decided to start the episode with, or the series, better said, with a look into Warbirds specifically on uh, Axis and Allied Warbirds, uh, Soviet Airbirds, Warbirds, excuse me, not so much, because they are not present in DCS, at least not one that I would find interesting enough to show to you. There is one, the I-16 Polycarpet. Um, without further ado, the topic of the first episode will be a short talk about the Focke Wolf 190, an iconic uh, aircraft of World War II with a rather uh, uh, rich history, uh, designed by a gentleman called uh, Kurt Tank. Uh, he is the parent of several other aircraft, prover proverbial parent, excuse me, and um, he was the brilliant mind that created the Focke Wolf 190. So without further ado, let's drive on to our airfield and through our airfield and find a Focke Wolf 190 we can look at. Uh, okay, I'll be starting to drive this car here. So this is a well, German military car. We'll be driving here at the parking wrap where we already have a Focke Wolf 190 Dora parked uh, as a static object for several other cars. And jump into one of these Focke Wolf 9 190s. First of course we will be discussing the A8 variant which is the um, uh, radial engine based one. Don't worry if you don't know what a radial engine is we will get to that as well. And later we will discuss the D9, the D9 Dora. You can actually see it here on my left. It has a long nose. The difference between the two is I guess their role. Uh, the D9 that you can see here is a high altitude fighter interceptor while the A8 is medium to low altitude uh, it was also used for ground attack it was a really versatile fighter another difference between them is the D9 has an inline engine while the A8 that we will be discussing first has a radial engine oh, but without further ado well let's uh, jump into the Focke Wolf and well here we are outside uh, the Focke Wolf 190A8 so um, this specific version as I said as you can see compared to the Dora it has a much shorter nose because the radial engine is far more compact uh, the wing configuration is also slightly different uh, but otherwise the uh, tail section for example of the Dora is longer for the purpose of streamlining as far as I understood it while the A8 is a lot more compact. Another difference would be the weapons configuration so they have the two bulges uh, on the engine and the four barrels coming out of the wings. Um, the A8 is more heavily armed while the Dora is faster and flies higher, as far as I understand them anyway. That would be one of their major differences. So let's take a look a bit through the history of this plane, and I've actually prepared a summarized history um, for it. So let's take a look. So in short, the A8 version that you see here uh, started operating in 1941. Uh, well, not the A8 specifically, but the Focke Wolf 190 
started its operational service um, in 1941. It participated in the Battle of Britain, specifically the early um, A series. And it was actually made to combat the Spitfire Mark V. It actually managed to beat the Spitfire Mark Vs uh, so thoroughly that the British actually developed the Mark IX just to combat the uh, Focke Wolf 190. It also uh, fought on the Western Fr uh, Apologies Eastern Front uh, starting 1942 in a variety of roles and throughout its long lifespan. Apparently, close to 20,000 of them were built. Um, it saw several variations. So, its main highlights, I guess, would be it participated on both fronts, uh, but started its career in the Battle of Britain. It was anything from a daytime fighter to a nighttime fighter, to a reconnaissance airplane, um, ground attack aircraft, uh, it was even developed to carry torpedoes and, of course, a high-altitude fighter interceptor later. This is just overall about the planes. Uh, among its main operators were the Luftwaffe, so the German Air Force, starting from August 1941, uh, being retired on Germany's surrender. The Hungarian Air Force also operated some of them, and the Turkish Air Force uh, itself operated some as well. Which is rather interesting, that it's something I did not know about. So, uh, back to the A8. Uh, the A8 itself was, of course, an iteration of the A version, the first one. Uh, it appeared in February 1944, so by this time, it was actually um, built to deal with high operating Allied bombers which it did to some extent it was actually i think one of the mainstay fi mainstay fighters compared to its cousin uh the dora uh it actually the a8 had a lot more numbers being in um uh, use compared to the other yeah to to the d um let's see what else well so over germany well, in the, let's go from the beginning. So, uh, in the Western Front, in the early months, it was introduced, of course, as I said, in uh, 1941. It decimated the British Air Force, spe specifically the uh, P-36 uh, um, Spitfire Mark V, uh, causing the Mark IX to be introduced. Um... Let's see, what else have we got here? Uh, oh, it was also used as a fighter bomber from June 92 onwards, uh, where actually it attacked towns in Britain. Uh, the Germans called it a Yacht Bomber, so basically fighter bomber. Mainly the A3 slash U3 versions were used from squ uh, Squadron Number 2 and Squadron 26, Yacht Geschwader. Two in Jakkeswader 26, and over uh, 70 Focke Wolf 190s unleashed a raid on the on the town of Canterbury, in Britain. Uh, it was a very devastating raid. It killed a lot of people, injured a lot of people as well, and caused a lot of damage to properties. But we are not looking at the political side. This is just a brief history of the um, airplane. Uh, later, it actually saw action in Normandy in 1944, but sadly the Luftwaffe was already reduced in strength by that time. Uh, operating alongside BF-109s, uh, the predominant version of course was the A8, uh, A8-R2, which was I think outfitted with a radar, feel free to correct me in the comments. Uh, F8s were actually a ground attack version of the D Focke Wolf 190, and the D9 uh, was actually used to intercept bombers. While the rest of them, of course, were used in defense of the Reich 
Uh, so operating against British and American bombers. Um, some of them actually were outfitted to carry a FUG-218 mid VHF band radar equipment, which is quite advanced for the time. So that would be a good example on how far it evolved. Again, most of these versions were derivatives of the A version, A4 and A8, uh, with the denomination A4 or A8 slash R11. So just so you know. Again, the end of the war came and the plane saw its demi demise uh, when it retired from the war. Uh, to compress everything in one episode, I will also talk about the plane itself a little bit, um, and mostly its actual systems. So, if you're unfamiliar with aircraft, we can actually use this because it's a very good way to show you how an aircraft works and what the basic system you could expect even in a modern aircraft would be. So, first of all, what does an air airplane need to orient itself or change direction when it flies. Of course, it needs flight control surfaces. And these are ailerons. And if you're look, looking, if I'm, I'm actually moving the stick now, you can see them moving on the outer side of the wing. These usually will provide you with roll, allowing you to turn. You have the elevators, which allow you to go, of course, up and down. Finally, there's the rudder. The rudder itself allows um, for ground control, for example, when taking off. But it also assists you with stuff like coordinated turns. And if we can zoom a little bit better here, I do not know if this has them, but usually you will see at the end of the elevators, uh, specifically either on both or on the left or on the right, something called trim tabs. So trim tabs basically allow you to set an elevator attitude or position, and it allows you to maintain, for example, speed or climb rate. That is one example of what the tri trim tabs do. In the end, you have the flaps. Um, the flaps are there in an open position under the wings, and usually these either, on some aircraft, they can be used in dogfights, but they will allow you, for example, for uh, takeoff and landing configuration, allowing better flow of air at low speeds on the wing. That is pretty much it. Next, of course, we have the landing gear, which are the uh, main landing gear on the wings. Two wheels that are coming out of the wings and a tail wheel. Uh, it's not a tricycle landing gear, it's an old style tail dragger landing gear. Nothing really specific about it, except actually, one little curiosity, it's actually electrically actuated which is, again, quite advanced for the time. Now, um, speaking more about this, of course, you can read yourself more information about it. Uh, the plane actually has an electrical system, and I will actually show you here inside what it looks like. The electrical system, you can see the cockpit itself is very clean. Uh, relies on fuses, which power different system. Actually, for a pilot, pilot it would be very easy, for example, that you can just you know press one and you will power a specific system uh, ranging from instruments to fuel pumps to weaponry that would be the electrical system as i said before landing gear is electrically actuated radios are powered also of course by the electrical system and let's see if we can see it outside i know it had it and it has been yes it has been modeled on this so behind the pilot's canopy right there where the black cross and the 12 is you can see a well square panel. That's actually where the battery is. It was actually mounted in an armored compartment. Just a little bit of trivia about the 40 Wolf 190. So uh, the plane itself could carry external fuel tanks. Uh, this one in DCS cannot because I think it was not modeled. But let's see if it actually was added. We can always take a look. And it has only one slot here. No, only one. Only bombs. Sadly, so no external fuel tanks, but it could carry a 300 liter fuel tank outside. It also has a fore and aft fuel tanks, each carrying. Actually, let's look at this fuel indicator here. Oh, it's actually here on the on the D9 is located. It's located here. So they have a capacity of 300 liters each. 
So it carries about 600 liters of fuel, uh, one for one aft tank, uh, plus another 300 in the external tank if it had one, we don't have one. Uh, finally, we have a BMW 801 engine. So this would be the famous radial engine I talk, talked about. Now, how do you tell a radial engine from a uh, inline engine? First of all, the Dora would tell you it has a um, radial engine, but no. Actually, it just has the engine opening there. It's actually an inline engine. The uh, radial engine planes they usually have a shorter nose, and you can see if we zoom in a little bit, those blades that actually are the radiator, if I remember right, that allow the engine to be cooled by air as you're flying, which is actually, in my opinion, better than an inline engine, but of course, I'm biased with my own opinions, you probably have yours. Um, the radial engines, how are they different? Of course, the cylinders are arranged in a circle around the crankshaft. I think the BMW 801, actually, let's look at my notes here because I actually took some notes about the BMW 801 engine. Okay, let's see if we can find information about it. And my, uh, I spent some time, so much time compiling these notes that, right, so the BMW 801, let's actually, I'm going to even show you a picture of it. It's going to be there in the left corner is a picture of a BMW 801 D engine. So it was a 41.8 liter uh, air-cooled radial engine with 14 cylinders, and it was used by a number of aircraft in the Luftwaffe during World War II, primarily the Junkers Ju-88 and the Focke Wolf 190. The Junk Junkers was another German manufacturer. Sadly, we don't have any planes that I can actually speak about. Now, it had different versions, again, from A to D, I think. Let's actually take a look. I think, yeah, this was a D. This is the D, D2 version. Uh, it develops about 1,677 horsepower. It's not the most powerful engine compared to the inline engine that the D9 has, but it did its job and for, uh, for the Focke Wolf 190A8. Another characteristic of actual uh, radial engines is they are far more reliable the, to combat damage compared to a inline engine. Now there have been cases, I don't know about the BMW 801D2, but uh, engines on American aircraft like the Vought F4U Corsair or uh, SBD dive, uh, dive bombers that the Americans use that actually were in use with the US Navy and were able to return to their ships or to their airfields with busted cylinders and all sorts of other malfunctions. So that is why I consider the radial engine to be better. Might not develop as probably as much power, but I prefer reliability to power. Now, again about systems, we're gonna go back into the cockpit. Uh, the plane actually has radios mounted on the left console here. This is radio tuning, so you can tune channels, of course. Uh, the radio is not completely implemented, and it operates on four channels. So you have channel one, two, triangle, and square. Uh, these are usually pre-programmed by the ground crew. Uh, this is radio mode. I don't know exactly how it works. And, of course, you have a volume knob, which where you can tune, tune your radio, either for navigation or speech. Yes, this actually had radio navigation in it. This is the radio navigation system. I haven't used it yet. We will look at it later. And finally, of course, I mean, it's a combat aircraft. Um, it has the weapon systems. So it has four MG-131 machine guns, which are mounted. Let's look at it here, here over the engine. 
where you see my mouse my mouse cursor that's where they are and in the wings it has four 20 millimeter uh, mg151 cannons additionally of course it has a central pylon for a bomb and the dcs implementation actually lacks the additional weapon options such as air to air rockets which are present on the dora they could also be used against air to ground and gun pods which it actually used with quite a devastating effect in whatever air to ground missions it was supposed to be employed um this is all i could say about it now at a first glance about the focke wolf uh, 190d i did apologize a apologies a8 um i hope it's been informative i really hope you will look at it yourself if you're so interested in exploring this aircraft more i'm not really good at going through history of things but i did my best to kind of give you an insight on the focke wolf 190a8 and in the next episode we will be looking at uh, basic procedures namely we will have episodes on each basic procedure such as startup taxiing takeoff procedure basic flight maneuvers landing weapons and so on now i'm not doing this to teach you how to operate the aircraft fully there are other people online like spot knocker red kite and the green reapers uh that have actually better educational videos on how to operate this aircraft anyway i would like to thank you for tuning in and i know i keep jumping in and out but i just I really enjoy looking at it i think it's a beautiful airplane and i will see you in the next one